Morning, new life. Happy Mother's Day. If you would find your spot and please stand as we begin to sing this morning. Desire this morning. Our desire is the words of that song that we would behold him there, the Lamb, our perfect righteousness, our source of salvation and forgiveness, and right standing before God the Father. Lord, I was um, moved and encouraged by our. Uh, study this morning in our first hour. Um, I pray that we would worship you in spirit and truth this morning. I pray that all of us, including our moms and each one here, would, would see the glory of Christ through our song, through the 
the study of your word, even through talking with one another, may we leave with uh, once again seeing how wonderful you are. Behold, behold him there, the spotless lamb. We thank you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to New Life, Be Free. Thank you so much for joining us. Happy Mother's Day. We will talk more about our moms as the service goes on, but let me just start as Andy did by wishing you a uh, happy Mother's Day to all of our moms this morning. Thank you, Andy and worship team for getting our service started together. Would you grab a, uh, your bulletin that you have? Hopefully you got it on the way in. Just want to highlight a couple of quick announcements for you as we continue. First of all, uh, note our church work day. It's coming up fast, just a couple of weeks away. And would you please notice the flyer in the bulletin? A lot of details there about what we're hoping to accomplish that day. Again, as I mentioned last week, if you know you will be there and one of those specific jobs kind of catches your attention that you would like to do that day, would you let Linnell know that? We just want to get kind of an idea of our numbers and then also maybe some specific materials that we need for specific jobs that you're interested in. So if you could give us that feedback, that would be very helpful to us as we look forward to that day. If you skip down just a little bit, uh, teachers and everyone, would you please notice we have a combined Sunday school hour next Sunday. That's our last one for the school year. So May 21st, all of us uh, during the 930 hour will be in this room for that time. And then something I neglected to get into the bulletin, but would you please note, uh, no prayer hour this Wednesday evening, okay? Just note uh, this Wednesday the 17th, no prayer hour for this week. Uh, Billy, would you come forward, please? And he will lead us in the reading of God's word and in prayer. Thank you, Billy. Good morning. Just wanted to thank our soloist this morning. I thought he sounded great out there. Thank you so much, Andy. Uh, uh, so this morning, uh, we're going to open up with uh, uh, Proverbs 14. And uh, there was a different verse that brought me to uh, Proverbs 14. But um, the first opening uh, verse out of there it says the wisest of women so I thought that was kind of fun to see you know in light of uh, what we uh, celebrate as a country as Mother's Day and but so I thought well we'll just I think that's more of the reason I should keep keep with on this leading here of Proverbs 4, 14 the wisest of women builds her house but folly with her own hands tears it down Whoever walks in uprightness fears the Lord, but he who is devious in his ways despises him. By the mouth of a fool comes a rod for his back, but the lips of the wise will preserve them. Where there, is, where there are no oxen, the manger is clean, but abundant crops come from the strength of an ox. A faithful witness does not lie, but a false witness breathes out lies. A scoffer seeks wisdom in vain, but knowledge is easy. For a man of understanding, leave the presence of a fool, for there you do not meet words of knowledge. The wisdom of the prudent is to discern his way, but the folly of fools is deceiving. Fools mock at the guilt offering, but the upright enjoy acceptance. The heart knows its own bitterness, and no stranger shares its joy. The house of the wicked will be destroyed, but the tent of the upright will flourish. There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. Even in laughter the heart may ache, and the end of joy may be grief. The backslider in heart will be filled with the fruit of his ways, and a good man will be filled with the fruit of his ways. The simple b believes everything, but the prudent gives thought to his steps. One who is wise is cautious and turns away from evil, but a fool is reckless and careless. A man of quick temper acts foolishly. A man of evil devises devices is hated. The simple inherit folly, mm -hmm. but the prudent are crowned with knowledge. Let's pray. Dear Lord, 
God, we thank you um, for this gift of, of your word, the Bible, and uh, we thank you um, um, uh, for this um, book we call Proverbs, and there's so many things that are um, just so the word was used today is relevant, and you are awesomely relevant and needed in, in all of eternity, past and present and future, and Lord, we thank you um, that you are here, and Lord, let's sing praises unto you with loud voices and a joyful hearts. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, thank you, Bill. Good stand with me. Service.
again, worship team. Alexander Pope is a name that we may not be too familiar with. Alexander Pope. He was one of the most prominent English poets of the 1700s, and he is remembered for leaving us with some classic quotes that have stood the test of time. For example, here are a couple on the screen behind me. It is he, Alexander Pope, who said, to err is human, to forgive is divine. And also, a little learning is a dangerous thing. They will be up there for you shortly. Thank you, Ryan. He also gave us this gem, and Ryan, you can just skip on to this quote, if you would, please. Alexander Pope says this, Blessed is he who expects nothing, for he shall never be disappointed. (laughs) Blessed is he who expects nothing, for he shall never be disappointed, as I expect you to see the slide. If I had not expected that, I would not be disappointed. No, I tease. We have issues from time to time, and we understand this is not a problem. Let me give you that quote one more time. Blessed is he who expects nothing, for he shall never be disappointed. Expectations are a tricky thing, aren't they? By the way, I have found in my life... um, 
that oftentimes I am quite uncomfortable going into a situation for the first time because I don't know what to expect. Am I alone in that? Going to a certain type of meeting or gathering and you just, you've never been to that place, you don't know maybe who will be there, you're uncomfortable, but when you've done it once, the next time is better because you know what to expect. Expectations are a tricky thing. We get a picture of something in our minds and it forms what we expect to happen, the way that something should go, what our job should look like, what Christmas should look like this year, what our family gatherings should be, what a ball game, the way a ball game or a race should go. We get the picture of someone and, and, and the way they should behave, how our spouse should act, how co-workers should treat me, how people should operate in the church, what leaders should do and not do, how coaches should coach, or moms, we expect how our children should behave and how they should turn out. We get those pictures in our minds of the way the things should be and the way people should behave, and when those expectations don't come to be in real life, we are what? Disappointed. We are often disappointed when that happens, then the way that something should go, the way that someone should be when that doesn't happen, when expectations are not met, we are disappointed. But along comes Alexander Pope in the early 1700s over in England, and he says, blessed are you if you don't have expectations, because then you will never be disappointed. Easier said than done, right? Are we good? Awesome. Thank you guys for all your effort. Last week in our study of the book of Judges, we were introduced to Samson in Judges 13, and after navigating our way through chapter 13, we cannot help but leave with some expectations, some high expectations. Chapter 13 in Judges does not allow us to leave without expectations as Pope suggests that we try to live our lives by. Samson's birth was a miraculous birth miraculous work of God. It was announced by the angel of the Lord himself. His parents were told that he should live his life as a Nazarite, a special individual set apart for the service to the Lord. And his parents were told that he would begin to deliver them from their mortal enemy at the time, the Philistines who were ruling over Israel and oppressing them at this time. Very few people, by the way, in the entire Bible have had the kind of birth announcement that Samson gets. Very, very few. And with that comes what? Expectation. Turn with me to Judges 14, if you are not there already. Judges 14, if you need a Bible, there should be one near you underneath a chair. Judges chapter 14. Last week, what we would expect, after last week, I should say, what we would expect should happen is that Samson's going to go out and recruit an army and begin to fight the Philistines. That's what we expect. We would expect that he would have some measure of victory against them. We know that it will be a partial deliverance. We spoke of that last week. But we would expect that today in this chapter. After all, that's been the pattern of this book, a measure a recruitment of an army and a measure of military victory. However, be prepared for some unmet expectations today, and therefore perhaps some disappointment. Chapter 14 today goes in a direction we do not expect, according to this book. Samson's story in chapter 14 is centered around a relationship, something new that we haven't really seen in any of the judges. He sees a woman, and he is love-stricken, love at first sight. We see an engagement period, and then we'll see a wedding. All of this is the backdrop of Samson's account in chapter 14 today. But the heart of the chapter is the expectation of Samson to deliver Israel. Then disappointment with those expectations. And yet through it all, listen please, through it all, the absolute divine direction of our God the divine, sovereign direction of our God. 
That's what we're going to see today in Judges chapter 14. Let's pause a moment and pray together before we dive into this fascinating account. Father, great is your faithfulness. We sang that this morning. Thank you for your faithfulness to our church body. I don't pray about it publicly enough, but we thank you for all of the, um, the funds that you provide uh, to do ministry here. We thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for all of those who uh, just honor you with their giving. Um, we are grateful for your faithfulness. Thank you for your faithfulness just to preserve us, to bring unity, to bring us mission and, and mission opportunity uh, around us in this community. We thank you for these things. And we thank you on behalf of our brothers and sisters, too, gathered in other local churches who, who you are so faithful to. We thank you for your word and pray that you would once again open uh, our hearts and our minds to Judges 14 this morning. Teach us, rebuke us, change us more and more into the image of Christ. And we ask for a special encouragement for our moms today. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, let's begin our study this morning with what uh, a section that we will call Love at First Sight. Our sections are going to kind of follow this relational uh, timeline, if you will. Love at first sight. Let's start by just reading a couple of verses together. Join me in verse 1, if you would, please. Uh, Judges 14, 1. Samson went down to Timnah, and at Timnah he saw one of the daughters of the Philistines. Then he came up and told his father and mother, remember we met them last week, quote, I saw one of the daughters of the Philistines at Timnah. Now get her for me as my wife. But his father and mother said to him, Samson, Is there not a woman among the daughters of your relatives or among all our people that you must go to take a wife from the uncircumcised Philistines? But Samson said to his father, Get her for me, for she is right in my eye should have some alarms going off in your mind with that phrase. Verse 4, his father and mother did not know that this was from the Lord, for he was seeking an opportunity against the Philistines. At that time, the Philistines ruled over Israel. It all begins in verse 1 when Samson goes down and visits the town of Timnah, which, by the way, is only about six miles, I think I read, from his hometown of Zorah. We saw him there last week. So it's a short trip. Samson goes there, and while he is there, he sees a girl, and he is love-stricken. Now, notice we are immediately told in verse 1 that she is a Philistine. She is from the people who are oppressing Israel at this time, and of course, this is critically important. In verse 2, he returns to his home and reports this to his parents. You heard what he said, verse 2. I saw one of the daughters of the Philistines at Timnah. Get her for me as my wife. And in verse 3, we see the parents' response. They say, basically, listen, Samson, isn't there a woman among our relatives, in other words, among our clan, that that you can marry. And, and not only that, they take it a step further. Can't you find a woman in all of Israel to marry? Why do you feel like you have to marry this uncircumcised Philistine? It's very interesting to note here what they don't say to their son. They don't say, Samson, this is against what the Lord has commanded us, do they? By the way, just let's refresh our memory here. God has told his people, Israel, in Deuteronomy 7, that they cannot intermarry with those outside of Israel. Listen, please, it had nothing to do with ethnicity, nothing. It was all about someone who worships another false god, drawing their hearts away from the living God. But the parents don't reference that. They didn't say, Samson, you were set apart to begin to defeat the Philistines, not marry them. Didn't say that. They didn't cite their son's mission and purpose. Instead, they just object to marrying an uncircumcised Philistine. Very interesting. 
We don't know exactly why the parents objected to this. Some think, by the way, and this is why I'm highlighting this, some think it was simply, in their minds, a cultural and eth eth uh, ethnicity issue for them. But whatever the case, they object. We would say strongly object. Would you agree? But in their objection, Samson responds to his father. Look at verse 3 again. Get her for me. For she is right in my eyes. Do not miss that. For she is right in my eyes. In my view, she's great. In other words, he's not thinking about whose view? God's view. Samson is operating by his senses and according to King Self, which is a major theme of this book. And by the way, this is how Israel as a whole is operating in this book. And we will see that confirmed in just a few chapters when the author just all of a sudden starts using frequently the phrase, Israel is doing what is right in their own eyes. Samson is Israel represented here. Samson's mind is made up. He is determined to have this Philistine as his wife. No doubt his parents are distraught. Can you imagine how they felt? Uh, surely this is not what God had in mind for our son, they must be thinking. But folks, don't miss verse 4. This, uh, verse 4 is the key to the entire chapter. Verse 4. Look at it again. His father and mother did not know this was from the Lord, for he, and I believe that to be God, he, God, was seeking an opportunity against the Philistine. The parents think, and we as the readers honestly think, that Samson is operating purely out of lust and greed and king self, but the author is careful to tell us this is from the Lord. This is the key idea of the entire chapter today, and by the way, even into next week, chapter 15, we need to unpack it more, and we will do that uh, towards the end of our study together. But please keep this in mind. This is from the Lord, this chapter. He was looking for an open door against the Philistines. Don't forget that. As the text continues on, we enter what I'm going to call, second section of your notes here, the engagement period. We're going to see two trips back to Timnah to see this woman and stuff with a lion, of all things. But all of this takes place before the wedding, so we will call it uh, the engagement period. I'll summarize these verses. You can skim them with me. Starting in verse 5, we have trip number 1. We're just going to break this up by the two trips. Trip number 1. It is clear that Samson is making this trip with his parents. He has obviously convinced them to pursue this wedding thing. And that would be the purpose of this trip, his parents working with the girl's parents on the marriage. However, on the way to Timnah, something very interesting happens. By the way, this is the section of the whole book of Judges that we know the best, right? If you have a children's Bible, if you grew up with one or you have one for your kid, this next couple of weeks are the stories that we most often see in those little Bibles. Something interesting happens on this first trip. If you look at the end of verse 5, they're traveling on the road, they reach some vineyards just off of the road, and it says, end of verse 5, Behold, a young lion came towards him, Samson, roaring. Now, it will be clear in a moment that Samson's parents were not with him when this happened. Apparently, there has been some separation in their traveling on the road, if even just for this moment. So the lion attacks Samson when he is alone, and now look at verse 6. It says, then the spirit of the Lord rushed upon him, and although he had nothing in his hand, he tore the lion in pieces as one tears a young goat. Now, I'm not going to ask for a raise of hands on this uh, to see if you're like me, but I have never had the experience of tearing a young goat. That seems a little bit unpleasant. But I'm assuming that this reference here makes Samson's actions a very impressive feat. 
to defeat and kill and tear a lion like you would a little baby goat. That's impressive. The Holy Spirit of God empowers Samson, don't miss that, supernaturally to kill this lion. And folks, this one, it's such a fascinating chapter, this one incident sets off a chain reaction of events that fills really this whole chapter and all of next week, chapter 15. This one incident, chain reaction. The end of verse 6 tells us that Samson, notice this, did not tell his parents about this incident, which makes me chuckle because you think that would probably be the most exciting thing they could talk about for the rest of the trip on the road, but he doesn't. Maybe they're too busy talking about who's going to DJ the wedding or something. Samson remains quiet. The parents don't know about the lion, and verse 7 tells us they arrive in Timnah. Samson speaks with this girl, look at verse 7, he speaks with her, and again, she was right in Samson's eyes, there it is again for the second time. By the way, it's quite possible that this is the first time Samson and the girl have spoken. Uh, Those of you who are married or have been married, do you remember the first conversation you had with your spouse? The very first one, do you remember? It is quite possible that this is their first conversation They speak, he's still love-stricken with her, the wedding planning begins. If you look at verse 8, some time passes. Do you see that right at the start of verse 8? Some time passes, we are told, and then we have trip number 2 to Timnah, still in the engagement period. Although it seems that the marriage arrangements have been made at this time, because verse 8 tells us that Samson is going down to take her. Do you see that in in verse 8? He is going down to take her as his wife, is what it means. It becomes clear in a moment that, again, his parents are with him. However, as he goes down the road, he is by himself yet again, and we are told that he turns aside to see the carcass of the lion. Do you see that in verse 8? I like that part. I think I would do the same thing. What about you? Hey, this is about where I killed that lion on the last trip. I wonder if the carcass is still there. I'll go and take a peek and look. In verse 8, he finds the carcass, and behold, skim with me, as he looks at it closely, there is a swarm of bees in the carcass and some what? Some honey. Now, if you think I'm weird for doing uh, the same thing and wanting to go back and look at a carcass of an animal that I had killed, let me tell you, at this point, I would be out of there with the bees. For some reason, I'm not very brave around bees and wasps, and so I, at this point, would be back on the road in a quick fashion. But Samson, look at what he does. This gives me kind of the willies. Look at verse 9. He scraped it, the honey, out into his hands and went on eating as he went. Not sure how he is doing this, putting his hand into a dead animal, let alone among bees, let alone eating what has been in a carcass, but he does. All joking aside, let's pause for a moment and note this is a violation of what? This is a violation of his Nazarite vow. Remember from last week? We spoke of this last week. Numbers chapter 6 laid out the Nazarite vow for Israel. Samson is supposed to follow this according to the angel of the Lord's instruction to his parents. And touching a dead body or carcass was something, number 6, that they were not supposed to do. He is violating his call from the Lord. He's leisurely strolling along the road, eating this snack of honey like Winnie the Pooh here. And verse 9, he gives some honey to, get this part, verse 9, he gives some honey to his parents, but he doesn't tell them where he got it from, which, by the way, if you, one author said, if you look at the Old Testament law, he's now making them ceremonially unclean. Interesting. Interesting. So note the parents still don't have any idea about the lion, the now dead lion, or the honey that was inside of it. That's important. They don't know. Samson is the only one who knows about any of this. Keep that in mind. 
So we have these two trips, both happening in the engagement period, both trips centered on this lion, and now we're ready for the wedding, okay, and the honeymoon. You can kind of tell all of this must be going somewhere, right? And you are right. The wedding and the honeymoon. If you look at verse 10, it says that Samson's father, Manoah, remember is his name, we learned that last week. Manoah went down to the woman. I presume that means the final wedding arrangements are being made with her family. But verse 10 tells us that Samson begins to prepare and oversee the wedding feast. The wedding feast. And the text notes that at this time, in this culture, it was the young men who would plan the feast. Now, one little side note. It is quite likely that with this feast... Samson is breaking another aspect of his Nazarite vow. What would be your guess as to what that is? One author noted that these wedding feasts often included a lot of wine and much drunkenness. So it is quite possible, though we don't know for sure, that Samson was drinking, which as you recall is another violation of the Nazarite vow that we discussed last week. So this is the wedding, folks. This is it. It's happening, starting in verse 10. But if you look at verse 11, something interesting again happens. Look at verse 11. As soon as the people, that would be the Philistines in Timnah, as soon as they saw him, Samson, they brought 30 companions to be with him. And the world's going on there. A couple of different views of how we could see this. Some believe that these 30 guys are friendly. In other words, they must, uh, there must have been some ancient wedding custom that friends are given to the groom to attend to his wedding needs. In other words, like, uh, like a personal attendant you will see today for the bride in our culture. There are others, however, who see this differently. Notice it says... As soon as they saw him, they brought these guys to be with him. There are those who see this as an unfriendly move by the Philistines. In other words, when they saw this Israelite Samson stroll into town, come to marry one of their girls, they got nervous. Likely they saw how what he was, how strong. He was. And so these 30 guys are more like guards. They were told to stick close to him and watch him in case he's planning something against them. Remember, he's one of the, the people that we're ruling over right now. Maybe he's planning something against us. I actually like that idea better. And so we will go with that for the rest of our study. This is an unfriendly move. These are guarding, keeping an eye on Samson during this time in, while he is in this Philistine-controlled town. So we have these guards keeping an eye on him at his wedding, mind you. And now look at what he does in verse 12. Let's, let's read a bit again. Pick up the text again in verse 12, 14, 12. And Samson said to them, the 30 men, let me now put a riddle to you. If you can tell me what it is within the seven days of the feast and find out, then I will give you 30 linen garments and 30 changes of clothes. But if you cannot tell me what it is, then you will give me 30 linen garments and 30 changes of clothes. And they said to him, put your riddle that we may hear it. And he said to them, out of the eater came something to eat, out of the strong came something sweet. And in three days, in other words, uh, halfway through the feast, they could not solve the riddle. Samson does not seem phased by these bodyguards. Instead, he decides to have a little fun with them, and he's going to play the Riddler here and give them a puzzle to solve. The stakes are clothes, outfits. He says, if you can solve the riddle, I will give you a set of clothing each, 30 outfits, one for each of them. However, if you can't, in the seven days of the feast, you each have to give me one. He gets a whole new closet. 
Obviously, the 30 men agree here. You heard the riddle, out of the eater, something to eat, out of the strong, something sweet. Clearly a reference to what? I mean, we know the answer immediately. It is what? It's the lion situation. That's why we were told what happened. Now, how in the world are they going to get that? <laughs> Can you imagine? They weren't on the road with Samson. They have no idea what he's talking about. There's no possible way they can get this, and Samson knows it. And so after three days of the feast, halfway through, the text says they're frustrated. They're not getting it. You can picture Samson in the middle of his wedding feast, maybe dancing with his mother-in-law or cutting the cake or dancing the macarena or something. He's doing all of that as his, at his wedding, and he's smiling. They're not getting it. They're never going to get it. And I'm going to get a new wardrobe. However, he doesn't see verse 15 coming. If you look at verse 15, the 30 men take up a new, I think your blank is strategy there. They wake up on the fourth day and they say to each other, look, we've got to change it. We've got to change this up. We've got to try something different. And so they approach the new bride, one of them, you see, a Philistine, and they say to her, look at verse 15, entice your husband to tell us what the riddle is, lest we burn you and your father's house with fire. Have you invited us here to your feast to impoverish us? These outfits are going to bankrupt us, which, by the way, we don't know if that's true or not, but they say it. Get Samson to tell you the riddle, which you will then tell us, or we will burn down your house. And with that, guessing that didn't happen on your honeymoon, with that, the honeymoon takes an interesting turn for these newlyweds. Samson's bride clearly believes the threats of these men. And so in verse 16, she goes to Samson weeping and says to him, look at 16, you hate me, you don't love me, you told this riddle to my people, and you haven't even told me the answer. <laughs> Not something you want to hear from your spouse on your honeymoon, you don't love me, you hate me. She is obviously trying to get the answer from Samson, but Samson is not budging. If you look at the end of verse 16, he says in response, look, I haven't even told my parents the riddle. <laughs> Why would I tell you? Again, this is not going well. Verse 17, she weeps before her husband more, and in fact, 17 says, I believe, for the rest of the feast, until finally on the seventh day, if, you skim, if you're skimming with me, he tells his wife the answer, quote, because she pressed him hard. And of course, we would anticipate the end of verse 17, what it tells us, that she then tells the 30 men. And folks, we have reached the climax of the events of this chapter at the end of 17. What is going to happen now that the 30 men know? Is Samson going to hear that they know and just go to Walmart, buy some clothes, and, and this is it? End of the story. Everything is just kind of peaceful. Or is something else going to happen? Look at verse 18. And the man of the city said to him, Samson, on the seventh day of the feast, before the sun went down, interesting, like at the 11th hour, they come up to him. And they say, what is sweeter than honey? What is stronger than a lion? They get it, don't they? They know it. They know the riddle and what happened on the road, and Samson knows how they know. <laughs> he knows that his wife told them. And so look at how Samson responds at the end of verse 18 to the 30 men who just solved the riddle. And Samson said to them, If you had not plowed with my heifer, you would have not found out my riddle. Guys, let me help you out there for a minute. You uh, young men, you unmarried men, let me give you a little bit of advice. This is not something to say on your honeymoon, okay? Calling your wife a heifer. By the way, yesterday was my birthday. You might like this little story. 
had my birthday yesterday, number 44, and some dear friends uh, from our Burlington days texted me, and they had a little calf born yesterday, and they named the calf after me, Stevie B, for my birthday. That, 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 that was pretty cool. So I'm not offended. I was actually honored to be connected with a cow, but men, you, you don't want to say this about your new bride on their honeymoon. One author said this is as offensive in the Hebrew language as it is in the English. I appreciated that clarification because it comes across to us as offensive, and indeed it would have been in their culture as well. In all seriousness, he is being disrespectful. He is being horrible here. He is mocking his new bride, and he is saying, look, you guys cheated. You got this answer from my bride Otherwise, you would have never known it. I wish we had the rest of the conversation. We don't. The author moves on. But the honeymoon, the feast is now over with that comment from Samson. And we now move on to his actions after or certainly right at the tail end of this feast. Take a look at verse 19, and we will end the text for today. I just want to read 19 and 20. Would you follow along with me, please? And we look at Samson's actions after the feast. Verse 19. And the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon him, and he went down to Ashkelon and struck down 30 men of the town and took their spoil and gave the garments to those who had told the riddle. In hot anger, he went back to his father's house in Zorah, and Samson's wife was given to his companion who had been the best man. After the wedding feast is over, just a couple of notes here quickly before we start to wind down. After the feast is over, for the second time in this account, the spirit of the Lord rushes upon Samson, doesn't he? The first was to kill the lion. Second, exact same language, to kill some Philistines. Samson travels down to the city of Ashkelon. He kills 30 Philistine men. He takes spoil from them, including sets of clothes uh, from each deceased man. He takes those clothes, travels back to Timnah, and gives them to the 30 guards. He has fulfilled the bet, but he has done so in a very taunting way. By the way, we have no evidence of this. This is just my thought. But I wonder if the clothes that he gave them were clothes that they were wearing when he killed them. Did he give them blood-stained clothes to mock them? We don't know. But whatever the case, this is a mocking gesture to give them clothes of their fellow countrymen that he had killed. Verse 19 tells us that in hot anger, he went back to his father's house. So just note, we are leaving Samson back in his home of Zor. We'll pick that up next week. But don't miss verse 20. Because of all that happened, the, the tense honeymoon, the name calling, his anger, the wife's father must have felt that Samson was never coming back. And the wife is given then to the best man of the wedding. This is a disaster of a wedding. This is a disaster of a honeymoon. This is a disaster of a marriage. Or is it? Or is it? It certainly seems that way to us, but there is another perspective to consider, folks. And I'd like to do that now as we begin to close our study together. We have walked through chapter 14 of this great book of Judges. Let's try to summarize what we've seen with two final thoughts, shall we? Two things that stand out to me and I think hold application for us today. Here's the first. Write this down. Shattered expectations. Shattered expectations. We began on this theme this morning of expectations. Uh, let's first note about this chapter that expectations are shattered. I'm going to give you two thoughts under this. Shattered for Samson. They, expectations are shattered for Samson in this account. Meaning 
the expectations that Samson had for his marriage are now just completely shattered, aren't they? This is, and I know we had some fun with it this morning, but this in reality is a really difficult, heartbreaking scene here. It has gone from love at first sight to name calling and accusations of not loving each other and the betrayal of trust on the honeymoon, all the way to the bride actually being given away to the best man. This is an incredible account of shattered expectations for Samson in his perspective. However, second thought, even more so, this is a, a chapter and a tale of shattered expectations about Samson. About Samson. We talked earlier about, and it's the title of our message this morning, Great Expectations, the great expectations that last week's account set up for us about our man. Miraculous birth, set apart to begin to defeat the Philistines, called, empowered, stirred. This is Samson. Very, very few people in the entire Bible have the kind of expectations laid on him from his birth. Can you think of a couple more? John the Baptist, Jesus, the list is pretty short. High, great expectations, but now look at him today. Immediately we are told that he demands a Philistine wife, which is a clear violation of God's word for any Israelite, according to Deuteronomy 7. And the author captures Samson's mindset by giving him the tagline, of the problem of the whole book, she was right in his eyes, king self over God. He's operating out of lust and desire with no consideration to obedience to the Lord. Next, we see that he, is, uh, he blatantly violates his special call to be set apart as a Nazarite. He touches the carcass of a dead animal. He probably drinks at his wedding feast. In this chapter, Samson is horrible at relationships. He is a self-centered, disrespectful, rebellious child to his parents. He is rude and insensitive as a husband to his new bride. But above all, Samson in this chapter mingles with the enemy Philistines instead of defeating them. In this chapter, he appears to be throwing his call out the window he was be, uh, born to begin to deliver Israel from the Philistines, not marry them and party with them and play games with them. But that's exactly what we find him doing in the chapter. Listen, folks, Samson is a colossal failure in this chapter. He is a picture of shattered expectations. Or is he? Is he? In a very real sense, he is. We've just outlined that over the last couple of minutes. But there's more to the chapter here, isn't there? And that's our second final thought. I would have you hold them together as you leave this place. Hold shattered expectations with this second thought. Write down divine direction. Divine direction. We said it earlier, verse 4 is the key verse in this whole chapter. Look at verse 4 again if you still have it open in front of you. If not, just listen. Samson's father and mother did not know that it was from the Lord, for he, God, was seeking an opportunity against the Philistine. Every thought we have about the shattered expectations of Samson in this chapter must be filtered through verse 4. You have to hold them together. These events were from the Lord because God was looking for an open door against the Philistines. What does that mean? How do we make sense of the whole chapter and verse 4 together? How, how do we make sense of it? With the shattered expectations and God's divine direction. Can I just share with you a quote that really helped me with that tension this week in this chapter? Listen to Daniel Block. He says this. You might just want to write this first phrase down. God is at work. God is at work. 
This marriage arises out of and reflects Israel's willingness to coexist peacefully with the Philistines, but God is determined to shatter the status quo. Samson is the tool chosen to rile up the Philistines, and this woman offers the opportunity to make it happen. The proverbial monkey wrench must be thrown into this comfortable relationship. It's a great sentence. If the Israelites do not have the heart to take action against the Philistines, God will cause the Philistines to take action against them. You hear what he's saying? How do we understand verse 4? God is at work. God is at work. He is divinely directing everything in this chapter. And why? Because as we said last week, and by the way, we'll see it blatantly next week in chapter 15. As we said last week, Israel in this cycle is comfortable with the status quo. Remember last week, they weren't even doing what in this cycle? What was the missing piece of the cycle language in, in Judges? They weren't even crying out. Do you remember? For God to have pity. They were comfortable. They're putting up with it, the oppression of the Philistines. And listen, that is exactly what it seems Samson is doing too. Block goes on to say, the only way in which good can come from Samson is by God overpowering him with his spirit, which we saw twice, and driving him to the task of delivering his people something he is not naturally, it seems, inclined to do. Samson had to be stirred. Israel had to be stirred. And so the Lord throws in the monkey wrench. It seems that left to himself, Samson would not have taken action. And so the Lord is divinely directing these events just as he wants them to stir tension and change. And so everything in this chapter needs to be viewed in light of verse 4 and God's divine direction. This woman, this girl, divine direction. This lion attacking, divine direction. Bees and honey in a carcass, divine direction. By the way, one author pointed out, you don't usually find bees in a dead carcass. You usually find what? Flies and maggots. But God divinely directs bees and honey to be there, which leads to a puzzling thought to Samson, which leads to a riddle posed at his wedding feast. The terrible honeymoon, the betrayal, the riddle solved, divine direction. Samson killing the 30 Philistines, divine direction. We might be tempted to think, well, that's just his temper. Or we could see it as divine direction and God starting to do what he said he would do through this man, begin to deliver Israel. You might say, boy, that's a pretty small victory. What are 30 Philistine men in the big picture here? But folks, listen, the killing of those 30 Philistine men is the so it begins moment. You ever hear that line in a movie, so it begins? That's the so it begins moment here in Samson's account. So begins the fighting and the battles in the beginning of Israel's deliverance. It's a huge chain reaction that all begins with these events. The events in this chapter end exactly where God wants them to be. He has divinely directed these things just as he desires. Listen, it seems like Samson is purely operating according to what is right in his own eyes, but don't forget verse 4. God is divinely directing it all. The deliverance from the Philistines has begun. It's a tension, isn't it? Shattered expectations and yet God's divine direction. Those thoughts led me this week to wanting to direct a, a concluding word to our moms here this morning, here on Mother's Day. Specifically, moms, as we are talking about expectations today, 
Let me ask you, moms, do you feel the sting of unmet expectations of your child? And of course, dads, you can ask this too, but we're talking to moms this morning. Moms, do you feel the sting of unmet expectations for your child? Perhaps they are not living for Christ as you expected. Perhaps they're not serving the Lord as you taught them to and as you prayed for them to do. Perhaps they're living in open sin in some way, in rebellion against God's ways. For Samson, that looked like the choice of his spouse and his vow. For your child, mom, here or listening later, it might be something different, but open sin. Those are all spiritual things that I have listed. Maybe your child, in addition, is is just not living up to your hopes and expectations in some practical ways. Maybe they struggle to hold a job. Maybe they've just made poor choices. Maybe they're disrespectful towards you. If that's you, mom, if you have some of those spiritual and practical shattered expectations, let me remind you this morning that you are in the company of Manoah and his wife here in chapter 14. They must have been devastated as they saw these events played out in their son. Such promise, such expectation, such hope, and now this? And yet, moms, if you have been through that season or if you're feeling that way right now, take comfort in the words of verse 4. Would you please? Dale Ralph Davis puts it this way. Verse 4 would have been a real comfort for Samson's parents had they known. They didn't realize this situation was from God. They couldn't see that God was seeking an occasion against the Philistines. Now listen to the next couple of sentences very closely, please, because I think some of your minds are going there. This does not mean they were wrong to object to Samson's desires and actions. Nor does it mean that Samson's desires were virtuous or that his bullheadedness was right. It wasn't. It means that neither Samson's foolishness nor his stubbornness is going to prevent God from accomplishing his design. Moms, on this Mother's Day of 2023, I just want to speak to a specific mom this morning, if you would allow me, the mom who understands Samson's mom in this chapter. The mom who has hope of one day their child walking with the Lord Jesus closely. And the mom who has the hope of one day their child serving him wholeheartedly. And the hope of one day a deeper relationship with your child because now you have the common love and commitment And of course, dads, that could be you too. And yet right now, none of those things are happening in your child's life. If that's you, moms, hear the words of verse 4. God is yet divinely directing. God is yet in control. Listen, even of those who are in rebellion against him. Every event in your child's life is ordered by God. I cannot sit here and tell you that your child will surrender their lives to Christ. I don't know that, and you know very well by this time that you don't know that. We don't. But I can offer you the comfort of knowing that God is sovereignly watching over their lives and in control that God is divinely directing their lives for his glory. Samson's parents were discouraged, and and we understand why, right? We understand. But they could not see the divine hand of God in all these matters. Moms, take comfort in knowing that God is in control of your child's life, even those who are currently living like Samson according to King Saul. 
I end with this short illustration from Davis. He writes this, and then we'll pray. Ehud Avril. Ehud Avril took three months in 1947 looking for a ship to transport some of his purchases to Palestine. At last, he was able to hire the steamer ship called Nora uh, in the Yugoslavian port of Brno. To all eyes, his shipment consisted of Italian onions, 600 tons of Italian onions. British customs agents would not likely sniff around that cargo for long, which was the idea. The 600 tons of Italian onions covered the real cargo, a shipment of Czech rifles that Avril had purchased for the Israeli army. Davis goes on to say this. This text, chapter 14, should hold some hope for God's people. Frequently, all we can see are the onions of a situation. The sin or the smell of disappointment seems to dominate the scene, seems to cover our whole map. But perhaps that's only the cover for God's secret work. Perhaps our greatest comfort is hidden in what we don't know and cannot see. Perhaps it's from God who has his own saving design design to work either through or in spite of yuck and muck. Many Christian parents have stood in the sandals of Manoah and his wife. They have, though realizing their own sinful inadequacies, they have yet faithfully taught, prayed for, disciplined, and loved their son and daughter, only to see that child willfully turn away from the Lord. No one can deny it is anything but devastating. Yet no one should forget verse 4, Davis says. His father and mother did not realize this was from God. What we don't know may yet prove to be our deepest comfort. Worship team, if you would come, please. Moms, I'm going to especially pray for you after we sing. But right now, Lord, I would just like to say thank you for your word What a fascinating, interesting chapter. We can both chuckle at it and at the same time feel the heartbreak of it. The players involved, I'm sure, were not laughing. This is heartbreaking to see shattered relationships, accusations, name-calling, disappointment. Uh, Alexander Pope's words at the beginning may sound nice, but we can never not have expectations, and so we're always going to have a level of disappointment in life. And yet, Lord, we thank you for verse 4. It doesn't excuse the sin here. It doesn't make it right. uh, His parents were absolutely right in, in saying what they did, standing up for truth if indeed that was their motive. But we take comfort in verse 4 here that despite the smell of onions, God is, is in control. You are at work. You were fulfilling and will continue to fulfill in the next couple of chapters exactly what you said you would do. And we thank you and you are so deserving of this song now that we sing of praise to you. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand with me, please? Let's sing, and then I would like to close with a special time of prayer for our moms. Let's sing together. Oh, deep and long, how high and
But moms, if you are able, would you remain standing? If you're not able, that's fine. But moms, would you stand for us? Moms of grown children, moms of children at home, expecting moms, if that is you and you're able and would like to, would you just stand? Um, children, spouses, would, would one of you or, or a few of you just kind of surround them? You can stand too and, and just kind of surround mom. Uh, if, if you see a mom that's by herself, would you go and, and stand with just someone? Just go and stand with them, please. Be a friend to them, and uh, let's let's pray with them together, and uh, just just be a friend and and surround that mom. Would you please and give them a hug? Moms, we thank you for all that you do. Um, I'm thinking of my mom today, who's visiting my sister. But uh, to all of you, thank you the critical role that you play, uh, play in the lives of your children. Let's just pray for them now. Father, uh, to start, since this was our focus, I, I, I do just want to pray for maybe the mom who can relate to um, disappointment and hopes not realized, specifically spiritually in the life of their child. And, and Father, I pray that you would encourage them, strengthen them to yet be faithful in prayer, and an example and witness. And Father, I, I know that there's moms and dads here who feel that in our body, and we yet pray even right now for that child, for their uh, surrender, the surrender of their heart to Christ. And I thank you for each mom here. Thank you for all that they do. Would you, would you just refresh them, Lord, with, with added strength? Um, we sang earlier, and we just thank you that your mercies are new every morning. And when we sang that line, I thought of our moms and just the mercy that is needed at each sunrise of every day to parent faithfully, uh, to discipline, to teach, to lead by example. And Father, would you just strengthen them today and in the weeks to come and, and may they, would you just empower them to show Christ to their child and to leave a lasting legacy of my mom walked with Jesus and left me that example. Father, I know that in a group this size, there, and really all of us, all of us have unique burdens and struggles in the home. And not knowing what those are, but knowing they are there, I, I just pray that you would be very gracious to our moms, whatever that looks like. Whether it has to do with marriage or parenting or just something going on in their own soul, would you comfort and strengthen them today? We thank you for them, and I just pray that we would do a good job of, of showing that gratitude and love today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, moms. Hope you have a wonderful day today. Thank you for coming. We will see you next week.